presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiko Obaka, said the idea of manual collation of election results by an independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, is a ploy to lay the groundwork for rigging for next year's general election. The former vice president insisted that there must be strict adherence to new electoral law, which supports a good use of technology in elections. He says such adherence was to the law was necessary, as it worked in other states whereof off-season governorship elections took place recently. But INEC also reacted, saying the explanation on result management procedure has been misinterpreted, misinterpreted but to mean the commission has jettisoned the electronic transmission of result and revert to the manual process. It said the position was not correct. INEC National Commissioner and Chairman Information and Voter Education, Festus Okoye, in a statement says, the procedure for result transmission remains the same as in the recent governorship elections in Ekiti and Oshun states. According to him, there will be no change in all future elections, including 2023 general elections. The statement was issued against the backdrop of media reports claiming that the commission had dumped the electronic transmission of results for manual transmission. Okoye says the entire gamut of the result management is provided for in sections 60, 62, and 64 of the Electoral Act 2022. Dr. Abati, a lot to talk about this. Okay, I think what is important is the clarification that has been offered again by INEC through Festus Okoye to the effect that uh, this was a case of misrepresentation. Uh, he, this, and a statement clarifying his position in the interview that he purportedly granted to the Puncture newspaper, uh, I think it's important. It was in reaction to the objections raised principally by the People's Democratic Party. Uh, Daniel Boala, spokesperson for the article campaign, uh, and I, uh, the PDP, uh, was on one of our programs yesterday, This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. And he raised uh, you know, objection that this is an attempt to rig the election by reverting to manual transmission of results. And this was, uh, you know, this will run contrary to the logic of what had been achieved with electronic transmission of results in the AKT and Oshun State's gubernatorial elections. He followed up with a statement later to say, why fix what is not broken? And that there was no basis for INEC to say that there will be a manual transmission of results. So that's why I think that the uh, clarification by Dr. Festus Okoye uh, is important. And maybe INEC will need to go a uh, few steps for that to continue to reassure both voters and the political parties that there is no attempt uh, you know, to change the rules uh, even before the game has started for the uh, 2023 uh, general elections. However, one thing that should be noted is that Dr. Festus Okoye made it clear that INEC is still acting within the province of the law. And he quoted Section 47 of the Electoral Act and Section 50, Subsection 2 of the uh, Electoral Act uh, 2022, both of which will seem to state clearly that INEC has the absolute dis discretion to determine the mode of trans transmission of results. However, in Section 60 and 62 and 64, Further clarification is given. And what uh, Okoye tried to clarify is that, yes, at the level of the uh, polling unit, the uh, officers there will first of all record the outcome manually before they then go ahead to upload it uh, to the uh, INEC server. And he, he's trying to reassure us that this was the same procedure that was followed in the Kiti and Osho, or Osho states. Maybe. Uh, Dr. Okoye himself will take a lesson from this, that there are certain things that are bet, bet, better left unsaid, better left unamplified. Um, you know, he's saying in the a paragraph, in the last paragraph of his clarification, that people should educate themselves more about what the Electoral Act says. Well, all of us are still trying to familiarize ourselves with the details of that Electoral Act to the extent that the test of a law is in its implementation. And the battle for the adoption of technology was a major battle after the 2019 election. So people are very sensitive about any attempt uh, for INEC to uh, be the implementer of the law and also assume the function of the interpreter of the law. So maybe that's the major takeaway for Dr. Koye and the whole of uh, INEC. But reassurance is important. But INEC must also know that now, 
on the issue of the transmission of results, uh, the public is already awoken to the need to be very vigilant. Otherwise, you know, the 2023 uh, process will result in uh, very serious litigations. Uh, what, uh, you know, uh, Okoye has done, whether it was misinterpreted or misquoted or not, uh, is to just draw attention to an area of attention for both the electorate and the participating political parties. Very, very well said, Dr. Bati, and I'm excited that this issue came up now as at this point in time, so that we even know the interpretation of the law and we get a hang of it. We all know that this election matter and using technology has been an issue that has dated back for a while. We all remember, and I keep talking about the Supreme Court ruling in 2019. Even the case the PDP was making then was, oh, what were the results sent to the INEX ever? What were the results, you know, put out there? We all remember the problem of coalition and how most elections are always rigged at the coalition center in this country. We all remember even that infamous case of, oh, I'm announcing this under duress. And I like went to challenge that result, but it went through. So we have many antecedents as regards the collision of results. But INEC must do more than just saying, oh, they are legal, uh, it's stated there in the Electoral Act 2022, there's a law there, 62, uh, uh, 64, 60. No. They must also ensure that in every polling unit, there's adequate technology to be able to transmit the results. And I will cite the case of Oshun. There was a particular polling unit that was reported that after counting the votes and reading out the results, the person said they didn't have data to transmit the results. It was the people at the polling unit that said, don't worry, we'll give you data. And you're sure you transmit the result. So apart from just saying it by the mouth, INEC was ensure that every polling unit does transmit electronically. And there are legal implications to that. So we must be careful. I'm happy the political camp raised it because we can see the world of difference it made in the Osho elections. We can also see the world of difference it made in the Ekiti elections. And only recently here, the Kenya elections, we can see the impact of Chipokati in that elections because everybody got that result. So everybody could see. Also, by exception, I want INEC to make those APIs available to all. So that take, for instance, on election day, Arise News just needs to buy a magic board and we plug into INEC API. We are giving results real time as they are coming in out there. That's the kind of country we want to build because that's what saved Kenya. That's why they have a level of integrity. Although some people are disputing in the likes of Julia Cherera and the likes. But Chipokati has a strong case today because everybody was following it. You could see it on the nation website. In Kenya. You could see it on KTV. You could see it on Citizen TV and all of that. And that's what we want INEC to do. So it should not just be segmented to a particular media organization or organizations. It should be put across board so that everybody can be able to live. And the API, I keep repeating, the API should be shared so that from my website here, I can integrate with INEC website. And as the results are dropping on INEC website, it will be dropping on our website here. So that there's going to be transparency. We just want better elections. And the battle has been fought and won for electronic transmission. Despite the fact that we will not forget to, some lawmakers went to the toilets when the vote was about to be done. Some of them even lied. Some of them, are we know in their villages there's 4G network. They lied that there's no 4G. We thank God all of that is behind us. And we pray the best person will lead Nigeria in 2023. And most importantly, our campaigns will be about ideas to change this great country of ours. God bless Nigeria. Moving on to the next story. Four Reverend Sisters of the Catholic Church have been kidnapped on Okigwe Enugu Road, Axis of Emo City. The incident was confirmed on Sunday by Sister Zita Ihedoro, the Secretary General of Sisters of Jesus, the Savior. The four Reverend Sisters were kidnapped on their way coming to morning mass. The statement gave the names of the four kidnapped sisters as Sisters Joan Wodo, Christabel Echimadu, Liberata Mbamalu, Benita Agu. The statement says the, wo the women of God were abducted on the Kigwe Omolo area of the expressway. The sister of Jesus is asking all religious faithful to pray for their quick and safe return of the victims. The Okigwe Road has become a haven for kidnappers and armed robbers in recent times. Many people, including the primate of the Methodist Church of Nigeria, Catholic priests, have traveled and have been kidnapped on that same road. Dr. Abati. 
Okay, kidnappers have also abducted six persons in, uh, in Dusima town, headquarters of Dusima local government area of Kassina state. Some of the victims were wedding guests who were abducted at a house close to the residence of a popular politician. Reports said the terrorists initially kidnapped nine people at Ungwa Kudu quarters of the town, but three were later released. Residents said the incidents of kidnapping the area is becoming worrisome and want government to address the situation promptly. Dr. Abati. Well, we've said it repeatedly that the biggest embarrassment to the Buhari government is the insecurity yes. in the country. One of the highlights of the uh, administration's pro proposal uh, to the Nigerian people in 2015, and on the basis of which, again, the administration can vast for a second term in office, given the credentials of uh, President Muhammadu Buhari himself as a war hero, as a war general, as a tested uh, soldier, uh, the expectation was that the government of the day, under his watch, will be able to deal with insecurity. But it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, whatever happens at the end of the day, uh, that will be something that he will regret, you know, uh, even after our office, that he was not really able uh, to solve the problem. Even in the twilight of his administration, contrary to the protestations, uh, by his postpersons, uh, that the government has decimated, uh, you know, the ranks of terrorists. Oh, when the government came into power, certain local governments have been taken over. Oh, under this uh, administration, uh, the flag of uh, Boko Haram was seized and uh, taken to uh, Aso Rock and all of that. The truth of the matter is that Nigeria remains unsafe. Whether it's, on the, uh, it's in the Okigwe, Axis, or is in the Kaduna axis, or is in the Katsina axis. It is so bad now that people are afraid to even go uh, onto the road. I mean, uh, over the weekend, uh, you know, when uh, some people had to travel here and there, some people were saying, oh, they will have to make uh, uh, security arrangements with the police just to move from one space to the one, one within uh, a space of 50 kilometers. Nigerians will be looking for police uh, protection. That is how bad it is. The second issue is the special target uh, that uh, wedding guests have become. This is not the first time that people who are returning from a wedding party or any other party at all have been victims. And this is not the first time that, uh, you know, Catholic priests or sisters are being targeted. And the question that has been raised by the, uh, by the uh, conference of Catholic bishops is why is there, is there a special interest uh, in Catholics? And you recall that uh, so concerned was the Catholic Bishops' Conference that most recently there was a, a street protest, you know, by Catholic priests and other members of the Catholic uh, Church carrying placards and saying that this is unacceptable. If uh, Christian students are not being attacked, Catholic uh, uh, priests and their aides and their assistants are being uh, adopted. And it's not in every case that they are rescued. It's not in every case you know, that uh, life is not uh, lost. And this, again, writes in very graphic letters, you know, the challenge that Nigeria faces, the frustration that uh, has befallen uh, many families. So you travel on the road, whether you are a wedding guest or you are going to or from a party or you are going from one part of the country to the other, you get kidnapped. You pay, you are asked to pay ransom. And, uh, you know, that economy, that underground economy, uh, you know, within the Nigerian space in which you have terrorists, you have kidnappers uh, making a fortune. It appears to be thriving and nobody has been able to address it. The uh, bigger dilemma or the bigger source of despair is that in 2023, whoever emerges as president, president yes, will be called commander in chief of the armed forces. But the, the person is not likely to have a better understanding or better exposure to security matters in terms of the details and experience than uh, President Muhammad Buhari, given his own background. So you have maybe a civilian, you know, uh, who gets in there. So that myth about a soldier being the one that could solve Nigeria's security problems, you know, will remain. And we will be wondering whether a civilian will be able to do it. Security architecture, a special uh, director in charge of uh, counterterrorism, all kinds of measures have been adopted. What else can Nigeria do 
to secure its people. Some other people have argued that maybe the thing to do is to address the economic problems that we face, deal with poverty, provide opportunities, invest more in education. But is it always true that poverty is the main causative factor? I don't think so. Because, I mean, there's extensive literature on it. That there are countries where people are poor, but they don't go about kidnapping other people and killing them. So this is all part of the national question. To make Nigeria safe is a major task going forward. It has to be said, and let me piggyback from where you started, uh, uh, where you stopped, Dr. Abati. It has to be said that this argument of, oh, somebody is an ex-general, he will be able to handle security better, from experience now is a flat on his feet argument. Because when you look at it, it is not because you are an ex-general that you'll be able to handle security better. It is about the strategy you have on ground to fight insecurity. An ex-general will have the knowledge about bullets and infantry and equipment, but there are many things that make a war. There's propaganda, the media outlet of a war. There is the economy of a war. There are things surrounding a war that the general might not know. And that's what is playing out here. And that's why when you talked about fixing the socioeconomic problems, those are valid concerns. A case in point I keep citing is Professor Hernando de Soto, the writer of the book, The Mystery of Capital. In Peru, they had a problem with a group of rebels called the Shining Path. And the people were supporting them, just like we have in this case in Nigeria. But they discovered that once they granted the people in that area where the Shining Path was operating property rights, then the people stopped supporting the rebels and it was easy for them to defeat the rebels. In fact, the major enemy of the rebel now became an economist called Professor Hernando de Soto. And it was easier for the military to get in. The question is, what's the socioeconomic condition of these informants that inform bandits? Because we forget there's an ecosystem. Why is it that we've shut down telecoms, we've done every measure possible, but they still thrive? But there's an ecosystem. The people that were kidnapped in Kaduna, we heard about how they used to give them 10000 to go and buy bread, toiletries, and the likes. Are there not people selling those items to them? We heard about how they had doctors coming to meet them in the bush. Is that not the ecosystem? What makes this ecosystem to thrive is what we should crack. The problem now is that a war economy has been built in Nigeria that if we don't stop, then nothing will happen. We are fast becoming, having also the problem of the military industrial complex. So it's a port period that causes this insecurity problem. And guns alone will not solve the situation. We heard, we interviewed a Methodist prelate here. And I am shocked that he's still on that same road that the Methodist prelate was kidnapped, that he paid 100 million. The Methodist prelate said there's an army post on that road. Till now, why have we not seen a combined team of intelligence officials go into the bush where the Methodist prelate was kidnapped and where he was kept to fish out those kidnappers? The Methodist prelate said that that kidnapper was speaking fluent Igbo language. So it's somebody that's been there for a while. Why do we not have intelligence to go after these people? DSS is churning out intelligence by the day, doing their own job. But who is following up on it? So it takes a lot to face security architecture in a country. It's more than just somebody having the knowledge about how to do the infantry fighting. And that's why the next president of Nigeria must be an administrator, somebody that has the mindset to administer, to use different approaches to fight the insecurity problem. Because you cannot absorb it for poverty and the socioeconomic conditions the intertribal fights, the farmer header fights, and myriads of other socioeconomic challenges going on in the country. So it has to be a multi pronged approach. And that's why we're also seeing the case of people being targeted. Christians, reference sisters now being targeted. Some priests were killed the other day. What have we done to fight that situation and fight it head on? Wedding guests, like you talked about, being targeted, Dr. Abbott. What have we done to fight that situation? Have we been able to mop up a community approach? Do we even interface? I'm happy they've been some success with the Amoteku and the army to be able to apprehend some suspects of the war killings. 
Can we do more of that? Can we celebrate the things that work and also look for ways we can bolster the security architecture? This fight is not for the army alone. It's for all of us. It's not for the police alone. But we must tackle insecurity because our country is becoming hell on earth if nothing is done about it. Well, so, so a multi-pronged approach is the way to go. Well, and we just I mean, hope we do it quickly, Dr. Bati. Yeah. Well, this, a single story never suffices, you know, and there are many ways to deal with a problem. Uh, but, you know, we must also, maybe to balance it, you know, commend some of the uh, successful efforts by the security agencies to rescue some of the persons and the efforts of certain concerned persons to ensure that persons are rescued. But the problem here is that, you know, this tragedy is becoming almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. In Kaduna State, was it last week or a few days ago, some persons were rescued, you know, by some kind of force, uh, six persons. But for every six persons that you get rescued, two, three, four days later, you will hear that another six had been uh, kidnapped. Persons who were traveling between Abuja and Kaduna in February, many of them are still in uh, captivity. What Nigerians just want is peaceful environment. Mm. Not just Nigerians, everyone who lives or works or visits this environment that is identified geographically as Nigeria. It's not that they don't have issues in other parts of the world, but the question is, the responsibility of government is to protect the people. Mm. When government fails in that regard, then you cannot blame the people for you know, perpetually complaining and saying that go uh, government must be alive to its responsibility. And it's not just the federal government, it is at all levels. Mm. Because there's a tendency here in Nigeria to blame only the federal government. States have responsibility, local governments have responsibility. You know, uh, as government often says, or as the uh, national security advisor often says, it should be a whole of government, whole of nation, whole of society approach. Mm. But the government is at the top of that hierarchy that uh, the Office of the National Security Advisor often defines. Thank you so much, Dr. Bassett.